Las Vegas is glitter. Las Vegas is hustle. Las Vegas is gambling. Las Vegas is unreal. And I'm not talking about the city of Las Vegas. I'm talking about the basketball team. And now, your running level. For the better part of two decades, the running rebels of UNLV were the only game in town, in a town that loves its games and worships its winners. With a brash, up-tempo style that was a little wicked and a lot wild, the Rebs shook up Sin City. They rose from the depths of obscurity to the heights of college basketball and wound up hitting the jackpot. Jerry Tarkanian's teams at Las Vegas didn't just score a lot of points. They scored a lot of style points. They dressed a certain way. They walked a certain way. They scored a certain way. They were hit. It wasn't just basketball. It was literally showtime. It kind of fit the community. Not quite out of control, but almost. There was a nastiness about UNLV because of the way they played basketball and they could go out and attack people. When a program is branded as being renegade, some people kind of latch onto that. People in Vegas, they see losers all the time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> all they want is to see winners. For people who grew up here, it was kind of like the first legitimate thing that Las Vegas had. It had a very strong, positive psychological effect on this community. People were aware of our community for something other than a floor show. They needed something to hang their hat on. UNLV basketball, that's my thing. Jerry Tarkanian's running Rebels were exactly that. Just play a good defense now. Just play a good defense. Jerry Tarkanian was a perfect fit for them because he believed that he could win anywhere. And he recruited the type of player that wanted to play in a place like Las Vegas. It was really a marriage made in heaven. But like many Vegas marriages, this one too ended with a nasty divorce. Even with all the success Jerry Tarkanian had at UNLV, it's hard to ignore the anguish he brought to the university and the university brought to him. The accusations and rumors, the questionable decisions, the NCAA investigations, all which ultimately tarnished the reputation of a school and its coach, a charming renegade with a trademark towel and a catchy nickname. This was my nickname, Talk to Shark. It started when I was coaching in Long Beach. We were right on the water there, and a sports writer named John Hall gave me that nickname. And instead of trying to tone this down, he embraced that, Talk to Shark. They would play the shark theme at the Thomas and Mack Center all the time. Fans would clap their hands together like a shark from Jaws coming down, biting on someone. And so Talk to Shark became sort of a national image. In that respect, Jerry made a great mistake in embracing the shark. Most people think he was a cheater, somebody who pushed the rules to the outer limits. You start with the fact that he looks like an unmade bed, and you add the type of players that he recruited, the success that he had at a place that had never had success before. They have won their first ever national championship. And hasn't had success since. Most people would say, there's only one way you can do all that and that's to cheat. One of the problems Tarkanian ran into is that his reputation remained on the lawless side. They were working within the rules, but getting around them at the same time. When players would get into legal trouble, there was a local judge who supposedly would take care of things. The rumor would get the key boosters, point guard A is gonna be parking cars Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, go get your car parked. And obviously what happens when you park a car in Vegas, you tip the valet. It's a town that's conducive to rumors and innuendo and false allegations and all that, and I'm sure a lot of the things that you heard about Tark were not true. When the national media was really focused on UNLV and the players and talking about how they're paid off, Jarvis Bassnight, the center of the team, a very tall individual, rode onto campus on a moped, and his knees were up above his head. And I remember thinking, well, if these guys are getting paid, they're not getting paid very much. There were always rumors of corruption about Tarkanian and the program, that players were getting better grades than they were supposed to get. Keep the defensive pressure on. 
Tarkanian was bringing in students who were perceived as not being able to qualify for college. And it really set back UNOV's at least perception and image around the country as an academic institution. That's a rough thing to have to deal with if you're trying to improve your reputation. The image fit. Las Vegas was a lawless place. Here's a lawless program. Oh, it all goes together. It seems that everybody in town is a rebel. It has always been a renegade rebel kind of town. And there probably is no better name for that university and its basketball team than the UNLV Rebels. CBS Sports presents Rebels on the Run, the rise and fall of UNLV basketball. By the early 1970s, the city of Las Vegas had already begun its march towards becoming a hotbed of glitz and glamour. Its university was a far different story. We had changed our name from Nevada Southern University to UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, in 1969. In the early 70s, we really did not have any name recognition. Oh, it was so tiny. They called it Tumbleweed Tech. It was desolate, if you want to know the truth. That would be a good word for it, desolate. It was always our belief that schools grow in good part because of their athletic programs, and so we thought that this town was ripe for that. The Rebels Club was a fundraising group to support the athletic programs, and the university recruited Jerry Tarkanian with the assistance of the Rebel Club. I really sought him out because I thought he was the best basketball coach in the country. Jerry had developed a program which was truly outstanding at Long Beach, another university which is quite small. He developed the program rapidly and seemed to be a very natural fit for UNLV. Jerry Tarkanian had started his college coaching career in the early 1960s in the California Junior College system, where he won four state championships. When he moved to Long Beach State in 1968, he instinctively knew that overlooked junior college players could have an immediate impact at a Division I school, and he was right. In his first year at Long Beach, the 49ers won 23 games and thereafter became a fixture in the NCAA tournament, one year nearly upsetting mighty UCLA. When UNLV called in 1973, Tark took his towel to Vegas. By 75, he was in the NCAA tournament and just two years after that, his Rebels were really on the run. That team transcended the game in terms of transition basketball and really showed how great a coach Tarkanian was because remember back when he's at Long Beach, they played nothing like that. They were the half-court oriented team. Walked the ball up, they played much like you'd see in the Ivy League. And then he comes to Vegas and he just puts in a totally different style. 94 foot game, pressure the devil out of people defensively, get it up and down the floor. He came here with no big players. So by necessity, he put in a running game and thinking cleverly, he said, you gotta have something exciting in this town. This is a lightning quick Las Vegas team. And suddenly, the running rebels were born. These are the running rebels of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, the highest scoring team in the history of college basketball. They build it up as that way, uh, you know, the running rebels number one team, scoring team in the country, and uh, I guess it is. We played with such degree of intensity, it was mind-boggling. They scored on plays like this one, a stuff by number 11, Eddie Owens. Tark's rule was, you go hard for seven minutes, and then you're out of there. We didn't want you to get past half court. We score, you try to inbound it, we steal it. We score again, you try to inbound it, we steal it again, and again. We called it a quick six. Stolen, beautiful steal, and Sam Smith ties it up. It was to college ball as Showtime was to pro ball with the Lakers. Something a little bit different, a little bit faster, and it was constant. If they scored on us within four seconds, we had to be back ready to shoot. The ultimate in killer instinct. We would score 200 if we could. Over the past two months, UNLV averaged almost 120 points a game. They didn't need a scoreboard at the Las Vegas Convention Center. They needed a calculator. When I first got here, it was it was really hard because, like, I come off the bench and everybody's going 100 miles an hour. And that is Casino for Las 
Las Vegas. 100 points again for the running Rebels. We're scoring all those points. A lot of writers who didn't know any better thought we were an offensive team. But they played the best defense of any team in college basketball. The pressure they put on the ball defensively, just uh, relentless, forcing the other team into a pace they were uncomfortable with. It was the perfect team because we had eight guys who played and they were all happier in hell. They call it the hard way eight. Here come the Rebels, and they're on the run. Owens scores! Eddie Owens got all of the publicity because he was a high point scorer, and his style was a little bit unique because he was left-handed. I used to kid and say that Sam Smith used to shoot from the locker room. Tony Smith was another long-range streak shooter. Once he hit one, he was on fire. Tony Smith hits again. Glenn Goners had to throw a couple of elbows if he had to. He's the hardest working, toughest kid. What an aggressive athlete he is. He knows no other way to play. Jackie Robinson is a good shooter. Robert Smith was my idol. He was able to distribute the ball to all of these great players, yet still be able to score 10 points a game himself. Reggie Theus was the all-encompassing, do-everything kind of guy. He could score, was a great passer, played very good defense, kind of the personality of the team. Theus with a fine play, great pass, and Robert Smith scores. I had nicknames like Houdini and the twirling Dervis. He'd be doing the Magic Johnson stuff, throwing the ball behind his back, behind his head, no look passes. Tark would jump off the bench as Reggie's making these passes. And Tark would just sit down because he couldn't say anything about it. Larry Moffitt had a great year for us. He's a kid that we got from Compton JC that didn't even make all conference in junior college. He was the difference in us getting to the Final Four. When you look back on it, you see how difficult it is just to get to the Final Four to do it. In the fourth year with the program that was near the bottom was really amazing. It even stunned Tarkanian that he's actually in the Final Four at this point. We were more confident than nervous. We are the underdog for the whole year anyway. Everybody's like, little UNLV, they're scoring a lot of points, but can they stop anybody? So we had to prove ourselves. Against favored North Carolina, the Rebels forced the action and led the Tar Heels 53-45 midway through the second half. We had pretty much control of the game. And then a rebound went up. Larry Moffitt got popped right in the nose. He's going over to the sidelines. He might have gotten his nose broken right there as Kondrasak came down and hit him with an elbow. He's really hurting. And this is a very bad injury for Jerry Tartanian because Moffitt is the key to his defense inside. As soon as he went out of the game, game changed because you could not come inside and get a shot off without Larry Moffitt being there swiping at the ball. With Moffitt knocked out of the game, the middle opened up and Carolina took control. North Carolina has ripped off 14 points in a row to take the lead. It was hard because we had big expectations of winning it all. The Rebel Sam Smith scored the final basket at the buzzer, but it wasn't enough. North Carolina wins the game 84 to 83. In just four years, Tark had turned another small school from out west into a national power, and with that, increased his visibility as well. When you get in the Final Four, you're no longer the little scruffy coach out of Long Beach or Pasadena. Now all of a sudden, you become the Goliath, and he could never go back. When we return to Rebels on the Run, Jerry Tarkanian and the NCAA collide. If Herman Melville hadn't written Moby Dick more than a century before the NCAA met Jerry Tarkanian, you would have thought the NC2A was Ahab and Tarkanian was the great white whale. Jerry Tarkanian first found himself under the NCAA microscope in the early 1970s when he turned Long Beach State into an improbable winner in the school's first season playing Division I basketball. We were tabbed as misfits to a band of roving gypsies. And that's the sort of thing that's created when you have a team that comes up out of seemingly nowhere all of a sudden. To the NCAA, Long Beach State's sudden success was suspicious 
And to make matters worse, UCLA, the reigning kings of college basketball, began to leak rumors of recruiting violations and grade fixing at Long Beach. Tark not only denied the allegations, he went on the offensive, writing two articles in the Long Beach Press-Telegram accusing the NCAA of selectively enforcing its rules. He was critical of the NC2A and was critical of the fact that they seemed to go after the small fish rather than the big fish. Putting small schools with no reputations on probation, namely Centenary in Western Kentucky. I wrote a blistering article. I said every coach in America knows that the University of Kentucky violates more rules every day of the year and Western Kentucky will violate in the whole year. He had a good point, and he wrote it. What he did was told the truth. He was new to this major college scene, and he didn't understand that if he said nasty things about the NCAA, it was going to cause problems. The NCAA wrote a letter to the conference commissioner and asked whether Jerry Tarkanian considered himself to be a big fish or little fish and indicated, well, I guess we'll find out. Tark didn't stick around long enough to find out. He was already in Vegas by the time Long Beach was placed on NCAA probation. And with his quick success there, the NCAA was again on his trail. You take starting from scratch and getting the Final Four in four years. That's not only amazing, that set off a whole nother set of red flags. I'm not sure you can blame the NCAA as an institution as a whole for this. I think there were probably some overzealous people in that institution that didn't like Jerry Tarkanian and made it personal. The NCAA's lead on the UNLV case was David Burst, an aggressive young investigator. David Burst is a man that believes in the high moral value of college sports, and I think he looks at Jerry Tarkanian as somebody who doesn't share his belief. For crying out loud! Burst absolutely wanted to make a point that the Jerry Tarkanians of the world need to be stopped. Following UNLV's trip to the 1977 Final Four, the NCAA charged the school with multiple violations. Among them were two Tarkanian knew he could prove never happened. The first claimed that the coach had arranged for one of his players, Robert Jeep Kelly, to receive a free airline ticket to his home in Pittsburgh. The second charge was more egregious dealing with UNLV professor Harvey Munford and academic fraud. I put Harvey on a polygraph test, and he passed it. Did you give a student athlete a B grade in your black studies course with the understanding that he would not be required to come to class or do any coursework? No. No. Did Jerry Takanian ever ask you to do that? No, never. Did you ever tell an NCAA investigator that Coach Tarkanian made such a request? No, I never did. They had affidavits from three or four students in the class who recognized David Vaughn going to the classes. They had a copy of the paper that David Vaughn wrote and turned in. The student did attend the class. He performed and participated in all the assignments, just as all the other students that were enrolled in the class. He did what was required, and he received the grade. They go into the hearing with all this information thinking, we're going to blow this allegation right out of the water. And the NCAA hears it, and they say, no, we don't believe all that information. We believe David Burris is telling the truth, because why would David Burris lie? We had tape recordings. We had polygraph tests. We had everything that you can ask, and, and they had nothing. And we went to the hearing, and they still said I was guilty. I actually had no chance whatsoever. If somebody is making that charge, I think he's trying to divert attention from what he has been found guilty of and uh, blame somebody else for the facts. You couldn't believe what you heard and how devastating that was to us. We realized that our belief in the system was not going to hold through for us. Although the evidence suggested otherwise, the NCAA still found that the school, and specifically Tarkanian, had violated its regulations. It placed UNLV on probation for two years and added that the university had to suspend Tark from coaching for the same period of time. UNLV reluctantly agreed, but Tark fought back. David Burst comes up and he says, Coach, don't worry, he said, I'll go by like water under the bridge. I felt like hitting him right in the mouth. There's no question I was going to fight him. It was clear that the NCAA wanted Jerry out of the coaching business. Jerry, of course, used the court system to enjoin them from putting him into any kind of a suspension or termination procedure. We applauded him for that. In the opening move of a legal battle that would last more than a decade, 
Tarkanian was granted an injunction preventing the university from imposing the NCAA suspension. This afternoon, Judge James Brennan granted Tarkanian a temporary restraining order, which in effect blocks his suspension by the university. It's unfortunate that it had to go to court, but I'm real grateful for our judicial system that I did have this opportunity. Most folks in sports would tell you that that was the dumbest thing you could have ever done, taken on the NCAA. The easiest thing would have been just keep your mouth shut and don't say anything. But he did it for principle. He did what he felt is right, and I'm very proud of him for that. Coming up next, UNLV bounces back as Tark's celebrity soars. We now return to Rebels on the Run. As part of the NCAA's two-year probation, UNLV was banned from national television in both 1978 and 1979. The Rebels still managed to win 44 games, but the lack of national exposure made recruiting difficult, especially impact players like Brooklyn's Sidney Green. He needed that blue chipper, as Jerry used to say. I need a blue chipper. But we used to get anonymous letters in the mail from a lot of schools seeing how bad Coach Arcania was. We were very curious, me and my family, and we wanted to see for ourselves. Sidney's mother loved Jerry. He was real. He didn't come with a shirt and tie. He came with an open collar shirt and those droopy eyes. I'm the only white guy at the playground watching Sidney play. He would stay from afar and I could see him drooling. He really expressed the need for me and he told me exactly what I felt I needed to hear. And Tark got him and he essentially became the heart and soul of running Rebel basketball during his time here. Green from 18. Sidney Green from Brooklyn, New York. Sid Green on the turnaround. No jelly, no jam. Just put it in the hole. Green might have been great, but when he was injured midway through his freshman year, the Rebels won just 16 games. It was the only time at UNLV that Tark won less than 20. And it might have been the reason he listened to Green and took the risky step of recruiting his son, Danny. I told Coach, you got to bring your son in because he's going to take us to that next level. Darkanian, nice pivot all the way. Play the birds, but no one scores. He embraced the idea that he was a point guard and that he was in charge. I was so happy that he decided to come and play for us because he knew how to feed me the ball. <laughs> You have your son out there and you're not winning it's not going to work so it was a gamble it's coming but in danny's second year we were number one in the country for two weeks first time unlv ever did that it was frank sinatra and lola Thalana and unlv basketball and perhaps the biggest star on the strip unlv's affable coach the bald-headed droopy-eyed jerry tarkanian you hear about siegfried roy Wayne Newton, but Jerry Tarkanian was a star to those guys. He was the biggest star in Las Vegas by far. Whenever he came into a room, they said, there's Jerry, there's Tarkanian. In his prime, Jerry Tarkanian, bigger than Elvis in his prime. Elvis would have run to get him a drink. He was Wayne Newton, Frank Sinatra times two. One of the perks of coaching at UNLV is you got to meet a lot of the stars and None of them were bigger than Frank Sinatra, and he became a real fan and a good personal friend of ours. Everyone loved him. Sort of a deity. They had little dolls at Tarkanian in the airport. He didn't pay for anything. I imagine people put his shoes on him in the morning because that's the sort of respect he garnered. Like most headliners in Las Vegas, Tark had a shtick. A meticulously folded, slightly moistened towel, occasionally placed under his seat, but more often found in his mouth. You always look really funny biting on the towel. That's where you got the nickname Bulldog. Bulldog always grabs the towel and starts shaking it. Arcanian works that towel. Look at that. Gil would always prepare his towels. I guess he would soak one and have one dry. Nobody else can wet it exactly the way he does it. It's, it's never too wet and it's never too dry. And he folds them perfectly. I guess it worked for him. He won over 82% of his games. The towel in place. Not necessary right now. That towel was like Superman's cape. It was like Captain America's shield. And they always say he was just sucking on it because he's thirsty, but there was something else there. There was magic in that towel. And gold in them dar hills. Along with UNLV's success came greater financial support, which led to the building of an exciting new state-of-the-art facility for the Rebels' growing fan base. My dad felt 
I'm real proud about it. It's something that they had accomplished, that we needed that facility, and they helped build that. We were moving from a facility that seated 6,500, and people said, there's no way you'll ever sell out a place that seats 18.5. And we went to 15.7 the first game, and the next game we went to 18.5. And I don't think we ever did not sell it out during Jerry's career after that. The introduction of players alone rivals any show on the strip. The only thing missing is the two-drink minimum. So exciting. Something I think the whole city was proud of. My mom was the one who applauded the fireworks. And at first, everyone was like, oh, it's Vegas. And now I see that everywhere. That arena pulsated. It pulsated the emotion and the love that the people had for that team. Your heart get to pumping, your adrenaline get to running, and you just want to play now. It's time to get it on. And the lights went out, and that laser shark started going around the arena like it was circling the team. And the crowd was so loud and so excited. It was deafening, and it was dark, and it was really pure Las Vegas show business. And then they started Gucci Roll, where they put in 72 chairs and they were charged like two thousand dollars a ticket i got gucci bags and i filled them with popcorn and everyone on gucci row i passed out a bag of popcorn with a gucci bag and that's how come it got the name gucci row we were making more money just off of gucci row than a lot of schools were making off their entire season but there was a downside to the uplifting experience at the Thomas and Mac. It was negatively perceived around the country as just another Vegas glitz deal. College basketball had never seen anything like this, and they weren't really prepared for it and didn't like it. This atmosphere has helped create a perception around the country that this university is little more than a basketball factory. I mean, let's not forget that a basketball program is supposed to have a place in a university. It's not supposed to be bigger than the university. And that was never the case at UNLV. That is the kind of image that UNLV is striving to overcome. Next up, will a new emphasis on academics stall the running rebels? By the mid-1980s, Jerry Tarkanian had done what he was asked. UNLV was a national basketball power. But there was a price paid to get there that some in the academic community felt was too high, especially the school's new president, Dr. Robert Maxson. When Bob Maxson came here in 84, he had a mandate to improve the university academically. He envisioned UNLV, and he would say this frequently, as being the Harvard of the West. UNLV can become one of the great urban universities in this country. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here right now. Maxson had barely stepped foot on campus before he knew that if he was going to be the leader of UNLV, Jerry Tarkanian had to be gone. He called me to his office for the first time. The first question he asked me was, do you know of any reason why Jerry Tarkanian should be terminated as the head basketball coach at UNLV? There were two things that bothered Robert Maxson about Jerry Tarkanian. One was that he thought people would look at UNLV as old and dirty because of the relationship Tark had with so many boosters that many people thought might have some relationship to Las Vegas' past. The second part was that Jerry Tarkanian was the most powerful man in town. Bob Maxson was jealous of Jerry because it was Jerry's university. We were in Chicago one time, Max was with us, and a bunch of guys recognized me. Coach, coach, can I have a picture taken with you? I can have a picture. I said, yeah, sure. So they gave Max him the camera and asked him to take the picture. They said that just pissed him off to know it. <laughs> and he made comments to people that he would always be sure that he earned at least a dollar more than Jerry. Now, what does that say to you? This became very personal, and factions lined up, pro-Maxon, pro-Tarkanian. The basketball fans, they were very upset because they would have given the right arm to help Jerry Tarkanian. There were a lot of big, big people with a lot of money that were on Maxim's side because they wanted academics over athletics. Steve Wynn's wife, Elaine, wanted to see the university change its academic and national reputation. They realized that the only way they were going to make that reputation change was to get rid of Jerry Tarkanian. While Maxim plotted, Tark kept coaching. He ignored the internal power struggle and focused on improving his basketball team. He started with two new recruits, Armin Gilliam from Pittsburgh and Freddie Banks, a former Las Vegas high school star. 
Freddie was a great competitor. He was a guy that was full of confidence. I would get a hand right in his face every single time, and you can look in his eyes, and he never lost concentration of basket. I call him Fearless Fred. Never afraid to take the shot. Freddie Banks for three. Banks, that's a three-pointer! My high school coach basically told me how to go to the elbow shot, and that's right at the free throw line, and shoot that. And then I kind of moved myself back further and further. My arm was getting a little bit stronger and stronger, and that's why I got the name of Fearless Freddy. He hit more tough shots than anybody I've ever seen. When the game's on the line, Freddy's gonna hit it. My feeling on Armin was he actually came here under the radar. Nobody knew about it. My assistant spotted his talent. In fact, Armin's first college game that he's eligible, I don't play him the whole game and we get beat. By the middle of the year, Armin's our best player. They call him the hammer. Armin Gilliam was like a he-man. He was the hammer when he got the ball. But he had hands like an angel. It's like he covered them in basketball lotion before every game. And he had just the softest little shot. Gilliam. Yes. The big guy, Gilliam, down low. He has the softest hands of any big man in the country. Gilliam. Once I got it down, my offense really came into its own, and I started scoring a lot of points. And by my senior year, it was pretty easy for me to score points. Wade. Gilliam. Oh. We were winning games pretty handily. I've done a lot of games for the Rebels, folks. I've never seen them any hotter than this or the opponent any colder. 33 to 6. 20, 30 point victories for most of that season. We knew we had something special. We wanted to take it as far as it would go. In 1987, they almost did, reaching the second Final Four in school history with a record of 37-1. and one. I just couldn't believe that our local college was going for the national championship. It seemed so big to me, like a kid on your block fighting for the heavyweight title. So it is Knight against Tarkanian, and the running Rebels at 37-1 and one are favored by four. I think we were overconfident going in that game. We were really looking to be in the finals, and I don't think we played our best game against Indiana. It was Freddie's senior year. It was my senior year. We were definitely the leaders. They couldn't stop Freddie Banks. There's a three for Banks. Are you kidding me? Fading away, going to the deep corner. They couldn't stop Armin Gilliam. Gilliam on the turnaround. He's two for two from that spot. Now it's Gilliam alone at the free throw line. He'll hammer that shot away. Freddie scored 38 points, I had 30-something points, but... Indiana was able to neutralize the other three players on the floor. Adio, off the move, the three not there. <laughs> but he misses, he misses very, very badly. Kind of a tough game to win when just two guys are scoring. Executing its plan to perfection, Indiana beat the Rebels 97-93. I really thought we were going to be the national champions that year. That's all we talked about all year long. I was so devastated. Not only do I remember the loss to Indiana, I still have never seen Hoosiers. I got on a plane and Hoosiers was playing and I had to put a mask over my eyes. I can never watch that film because I hate that Indiana team so much. When Rebels on the Run returns, a risky recruit nearly destroys the program. Lloyd Daniels could do everything. They call him Sweet Pea. Absolutely everything. He was a guy who actually could dribble with his knees. I saw that. If he had played at UNLV, he may have been the best player that UNLV ever had. And there are many who said he was the greatest street ball player of all time. In July 2000, we started the Five Star Basketball Hall of Fame. Here are some of the players who have been inducted. Michael Jordan, Christian Leitner, Rasheed Wallace, Sid Green, Len Bias, Dominique Wilkins, Patrick Ewing, Grant Hill, Alonzo Mourning, Michael Korn, and Isaiah Thomas. All those guys played at the camp, and Lloyd Daniels was better than all of them as a high school junior. And it's documented, it's fact. Howie Garfield, when he first saw me play, he said, this guy's got God-gifted talent. Jerry always expressed the fact that he thought Lloyd could be the best point guard ever. He had a feel for basketball. He was like Magic Johnson, but a much better shooter than Magic. He reminded me of Magic the way he passed the ball. 
and he could see like two plays ahead. Larry Brown went bananas when he saw this kid for the first time. He jumped out of his chair three times on plays that this kid made. I could play with four scrubs and make them look good. Lloyd's the finest basketball players I've ever been associated with. The only question is, will he get his academics up? That's what we're all hoping for. Lloyd Daniels' talent was seductive in spite of the warning signs. Still, it was possible that Jerry Tarkanian saw Daniels as something more than a basketball prodigy capable of leading UNLV to its first national championship. Tark had a history with troubled recruits. He believed in giving them the same chance someone had once given him. This is my Pasadena City College team when I played. I played fairly well there, and then we moved on to Fresno State, and I played two years there. My last semester, I was captain of the team. He was certainly fun-loving in college. They used to have some well-known parties at their house. I never missed a party. But as far as academics were concerned, he really didn't care much. I wasn't much of a student when I was in college until I met my wife, Lois. She was an honor student, and she got me motivated in academics. And that was a factor that made me feel that I could do the same thing with many of my players. Jury said to me, why should those kids who are unfortunate and who have trouble academically be excluded from the puzzle? Coach Wooden always said, I would rather go too far with someone than not far enough. I want to give him every opportunity. Jerry felt that very same way. A lot of them came from broken homes or the inner city. He gave them that chance and he treated them with respect. Tarkin had a deep sense of the needs of young African-American athletes out of urban areas, social isolation. He wasn't afraid to go in there and develop personal and family relationships with them and care about them more than just athletes. When you say the name Jerry Tarkin, it's like a father figure to me. This is a guy who didn't come from a background of wealth, and he could see some of himself in these kids. Is he doing all right? Is he lying to me? That always put Jerry in the hot seat, so to speak, because he gave a guy a chance that maybe didn't do the right things. He's doing all right in some of what he's supposed to be doing. There is more that he has to do. Do it! The system always thought that he was wrong for doing what he did, but he has a right to do what he feels is right. The problem, of course, was that it also has an effect on our reputation. When Tarkanian came here, faculty members were worried. You're recruiting kids who have no business in college. He said, you're probably right. I'm not UCLA. I'm not Notre Dame. I can't compete with them. So I have to go for the kids that other schools don't want. So we get them to UNLV. They don't show up for all of your classes, but we try to get them there at least. And they have a chance for an education. Really just hard to argue with that reasoning. The NCAA didn't like that which is sad because those are the kids you want to give a chance to. I think it's more important to help those type of kids than it is the honor student. The honor student can help himself. And sure, UNLV had the admissions policies that allowed him to provide those opportunities. He always felt that he could work with anybody. And if they could play, he didn't worry about what people would say. I'm not so sure he was being the father Flanagan. I think he was trying to win basketball games. Whatever his reason, Tark was drawn to Daniels like a moth to fire. And for that, he set himself up to get burned. The Lloyd Daniels case stretched Jerry's credibility with some people in the community. The people in town who love the program would excuse nearly anything. But now you have Maxim here. There's a bigger push toward academics, and the thought is, what is going on here? I said to him, you cannot recruit Lloyd. I said, this is what Maxon's waiting for. It's just walking into a trap that the NCAA didn't even have to set. But to try to say that my dad recruited nobody else would touch him is a lie. It was us, St. John's, Syracuse, and Kansas. I'm not sure you could have talked Jerry out of trying to recruit him at the time. He viewed it as a challenge. I thought that with our monitoring him and doing the things that we do, he had a chance to be successful. You had to take a shot and hope someone would reach him or some miracle would happen. With his reading skills reported to be at a third grade level, Lloyd Daniels somehow managed to get through junior college and into UNLV. In February of 1987, he was just two weeks away from enrolling when he embarrassed both himself and the university. It's tall as hell. You have to be a rebel. Don't say that. We don't need that. I know. God, I hope not. When you're in a place like a Nevada, Las Vegas, where you're 18 years old, you got a little money in your pocket, you got everybody telling you how great you is, you can make a mistake. Guess who we just got? 
Don't tell me a basketball player. I did. Lloyd Daniels. No. The story just escalated huge. You realize what you may have done to your career? When he gets arrested at a crack house, you know, the pictures, they just don't look good. I let a lot of people down who believed in me. Jerry just wanted Lloyd Daniels to come to UNLV. It was a feather in the hat to get the best player in the land. He wasn't thinking of the consequence of what happened. He thought I could straighten him out. We definitely took a risk there, and it backfired on us, but I still like Lloyd to this day. We've had a very good relationship. That was it for Tardini, as a national perception goes. We now knew that he would go to any lengths to get basketball players to play for him. Although the Daniels affair nearly ruined Tark's reputation, there was at least one other coach who couldn't resist the lure of a great talent. Larry Brown called up two weeks later looking for Lloyd Daniels. He was going to let me move in his house and let me play at Kansas. That's scary, ain't it? When we return, a startling revelation delivers a haunting blow. We now return to Rebels on the Run. Following the Lloyd Daniels fiasco, the last thing Jerry Tarkanian and UNLV needed was more bad press. But that's exactly what came their way. A March 89 Time Magazine article revealed that the AAU coach who first brought Daniels to UNLV was not Sam Perry, but rather Richie the Fixer Perry, who had been convicted of fixing college basketball games in the 1979 Boston College scandal. Shock, absolute shock. This guy had two names. Jerry, at first, really only knew of him as some AAU guy from New York who could get him a player or two. He came in my office and he introduced himself. He said he was from New York City, he was in the commodities business, that he coached Bulls of Scurry in the AAU League. I thought that was great. Jerry had no idea who Sam Perry was, what he was, and where he came from. I had no idea who he was. I'd never even seen the guy before in my life until he came in the office. I know that is the story that Jerry Tarkanian has said and said consistently. Richie the Fixer was well known to so many folks in college sports if he didn't know, and others did, and clearly they did in that town. The people who were around him failed him because they should have told him. And don't tell me that if his players are consorting with somebody like that, that Tark doesn't know about it. And if he doesn't know about it, it's because he doesn't want to know about it, and I think that's worse. What is the reputation of my husband? The reputation is his whole life is basketball. He's not paying attention to the other things. He gets up in the morning and he thinks basketball. So, so, so. And then he has lunch and he thinks basketball. You got to give 100%, not 90. He has dinner and he talks basketball. He'd be taking the salt and pepper shakers and the little sugar packets, you know, doing plays. And after dinner, he goes home and he watches basketball. And then he gets up the next morning and he coaches basketball. He's the most one-dimensional man in the world. And basketball is the dimension. We're running from charges. I didn't pay any attention to anything other than basketball. Step in there and take the charge when they drive! 100% of the time, 24 hours a day. He used to always call me Josephine Agnes. And I asked, why do you keep calling me Agnes? And he goes, isn't that your middle name? And I said, no, my middle name's Carol. Tark heard Christmas carols being played throughout the airport. And he turned to his manager and he said, why are they playing Christmas carols? And the manager said, well, coach, tomorrow's Christmas. I had a rabbit for about... Two years that lived upstairs in Jody's room. Never knew we had the rabbit until one day he was on the sofa and the rabbit hopped down the stairs and he says, Where the hell is that? Where the hell is that? You have no interest. I mean, there's no, I have no interest. He had incredible focus on basketball. Shoot the ball, don't throw it at the back, get a little arch, lift it up a little. And most of the rest of life, other than his family, wasn't unimportant to him, it's just non existent for him. One of the reasons it made him so good at what he did, as well as obviously limit him in some ways, too. True to his personality, Tark paid little attention to the negative press brought on by Daniels and Perry. He did retain his passion for coaching, his goal of leading UNLV to a national championship, and his obsession for recruiting great talent, like Stacy Augman. Stacy Augman came to us as one of the great defensive players out of high school. Ball punched away, steal, there goes Augman. All the way for the slam dunk. Boy, he's going to be something in this program. Here's a pass underneath dog and slam dunk. And it ended up being just one of the best all-round players, period. Intercepted. Augman's got it. Unselfishly gives it up. Kyle James unselfishly gives it back. I love that. 
UNLV finished Augman's freshman season with a record of 28 and 6 and built on that team by adding a remarkable recruiting class prior to the 1988-89 season. Moses Scurry, David Butler, George Ackles, Anderson Hunt, and Greg Anthony helped the Rebs get to the Elite Eight. By everyone's judgment, they were just one player away. The missing piece of all that, obviously, was Larry Johnson. He was the number one JC player coming out of JC. UNLV or any place my dad's ever been at never got a player like that. I would have let him sleep in my bed every night while I laid on the floor to get him to come to UNLV. To get Larry was really the coup of my father's whole recruiting career. He ended up being that giant piece in the middle of the floor that we're always missing. The guy who could just dominate the middle and take no prisoners. Four on one the other way. Anthony gives it up to Larry Johnson for a dunk. Not just a strong physical presence, but he could run and he could jump and he was quick. Such a good all-around athlete that he could dominate a game like seven-footers could dominate games. On top of all that, he understood that in order for him to get where he wanted to go in terms of winning the championship, he had to make sure we all were better basketball players. Not only was he a phenomenal talent, but Larry was one of those few individuals that had the ability to make everybody feel good about being on that team. Anytime you have your best player shouldering responsibility and being a leader in terms of his work ethic and his intensity, it just raises the level of everybody else. Coming up, the Rebels rise to the occasion and deliver a performance for the ages. There was this poster of the starting five, and no matter where you went, there was that poster. And any time these guys would go somewhere, they'd be hounded for autographs. They were really celebrities in the town at that time. These players had been together for two or three years. Larry Johnson, it's his first year, but he's already a man among children. These are full-grown men playing a college game. They wanted to make that point every time they stepped out on the floor. The NC2A was screwing with us early because they knew we were going to be good. It seemed like every time we turned around as reporters, we were writing about some type of controversy that Rebel Basketball was involved with. Starting guard Greg Anthony and starting center David Butler have been declared ineligible by the NCAA for this one game. The NCAA decision is based on its conclusion that Anthony and Butler have owed money for long-distance telephone calls made on road trips. Our guys felt like we were picked on. It was as if we were constantly on trial. Hold this guy up for two games. That guy had peanuts in Hawaii and didn't pay for him. Hold him out. Disciplinary issues that became public, some of them just weren't that big a deal, but because they were associated with Tark and Vegas, they got overblown. That team bonded together and said, you know what, we're not going to let the NCAA beat us down. We're going to win the whole thing. Despite the optimism, the Rebels got off to a sluggish start, losing three games early in the year. On February 12th, 1990, they were beginning to play to their potential when their championship drive was nearly derailed. We were playing at Fresno State, and I was going in for a layup. He's in the air. And one of the opposing players took my legs out. He loses his balance. And unfortunately, I couldn't break my fall with my hands, so the next best thing was my face. And Greg Anthony is slow and getting up. He's still down. His head hit the floor with such a thud. It was like a sickening kind of thud. And he didn't move, and our first instinct, oh my God, he's dead. He is writhing in pain. I don't believe he has even opened his eyes yet. Broke my jaw in two places, broke my chin, kind of knocked me out. I had to have surgery that night, and the doctor, I heard him whispering, just saying, my season was over. I just broke down. I was just hurt because we had so many high expectations. Nobody would have said a word had he just pulled up a chair on the bench and sat out. I mean, this guy had a legitimate injury. I figure Greg's out for the year. They're practicing the next day in the North Gym. And who walks into practice but Greg Anthony wearing a hockey helmet with this face mask? As one of the captains and a leader on that team, I had to show guys that I was committed to doing whatever it took. Remarkably, just three days later, Anthony was back on the court and did not miss a game the rest of the season. It is a broken jaw, wired shut. They must protect the nose. 
Because that's his remaining breathing apparatus. The rest of the year he played that way with the jaw wired. Even Tart is amazed at this young man's tenacity. Diving on the floor is oh. Anthony's hit the nose. If anything happens to this nose, they've got to get a doctor out here to cut the wires in that broken jaw. And our team just rallied around him. Anthony's had two threes today. That time he gets in close. They can't stop the man with the broken jaw. I honestly believe that that's what made that team that good. Anthony Long with a dunk. To see Greg come out and play, I mean, you just can't help but to get motivated. They all respected Greg, and, you know, he couldn't talk anymore, so they liked that, too. Anthony might not have been able to speak, so the rest of the Rebels did the talking for him, taking UNLV to Tark's third Final Four. In Denver, UNLV got past Georgia Tech 90-81 and moved into the 1990 NCAA Final. UNLV goes to its first ever. NCAA championship game. It'll be Las Vegas against Duke Monday night. This thing had become kind of a crusade to get Tark over the top. Because remember, he had tried in 77 and he had tried in 87. Came up short in the national semifinals both times. For the players, they saw this as, this is for coach. Let's get him his national championship. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the McNichol Sports Arena in Denver for tonight's national championship game between the Duke Blue Devils and the UN Running Rebels. Either you rooted for the old traditional style Duke basketball, predominantly white players, versus the African-American style of basketball, UNLV. This was one of those instances of negative connotation or not where there was this racial pride injected into a sporting event. It was being played up as kind of a good and evil thing. Of course, Duke is the goody two-shoes of college basketball. Vegas had gone all season thugging around, not only being great, but being thugs, intimidating people, roughhousing people, getting in fights. So yeah, it was a good versus evil. That was probably another rallying point, not that this team needed one. We went out and we played our butts off, but everything went right too in that game. Vegas brings it down, no score yet. They find Hunt, gets inside, 11-6 now, Vegas. Stacy Ogman is the best finisher on the break that I have ever seen in college basketball. Hunt's three. Ogman, Henderson's back. He's special. And that was almost a laugher. I mean, at halftime, it was pretty clear they weren't going to beat us. And we have come to the end of the first half. It has been a Vegas story here. They played so great, and they kept pulling farther and farther away. There is Johnson, and now it is 50-35. Leitner out on Johnson, who puts it on the floor on the dribble and uses the glass. This is a 15-0 run. Snap pass now to Hunt. Score the triple. It's all the running revs. Duke had a really good team, and they looked like a JV squad that night. That has to be the single most dominating performance in a championship game. This night belongs to Las Vegas. They have won their first ever national championship and in three trips. The Shark comes away a winner in a record-setting night, 103-73. I doubt that there was a single evening in Las Vegas that was more exciting for the people who lived in Las Vegas. Easily the greatest sports moment of my life, definitely above the birth of either of my children, maybe the greatest moment of my life. I felt great. You know, everybody kept saying, now it's vindictiveness. You shove it up the NC2A. No, that, I wouldn't even think about that. I was just so happy we won. So happy for the people in Vegas. We always felt as though we were the ultimate entertainment destination and we had things that no other city in the United States had. But now we were something very, very, very special. We'd like to present the president with a sweater and also an autographed basketball and a hat signifying the national championship season we enjoyed this year. The NC2A champion, Las Vegas, Nevada. People would never have dreamt that. You get this on film? Yeah, yeah they're getting it over, over right here. This is hey, give me a number one finger. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Give me a number one you finger. got it, yeah. Up next, Tark and the Rebels run into their toughest opponent, the NCAA.
Three months after the Running Rebels won the national championship, the 13-year legal battle between UNLV, Jerry Tarkanian, and the NCAA was resolved. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the NCAA had the right to discipline a school without due process. Although the injunction Tark had won in 1977 allowing him to continue to coach was permitted to stand, the court's ruling cleared the way for the NCAA to discipline UNLV, saying that the school had not followed the punishment guidelines it had set for Tarkanian 13 years earlier. The NCAA barred the university from appearing in the 1991 NCAA tournament. The Rebels could not defend their national championship. We didn't expect that. Nobody did. All of this was going on while they were winning the national championship with what was considered maybe the best college basketball team of all time. It didn't matter that Tark had brought his university a national championship. UNLV's president, Bob Maxson, was convinced the time was right to finally rid his school of Jerry Tarkanian. Maxson felt that if he could get enough dirt on Jerry and publicly air it, that he wouldn't need the NCAA's help to run Tark out. The public would force the issue. I said, Dr. Maxson, it's obvious that the NCAA wants me. It's not the university, they want me. I'll voluntarily sit out the tournament. Maxson said, well, that's very nice of you, Jerry but don't go public with that because we want to present that to the NC2A. They think that you've got too much power here. You're running the university, not us. So we want to make that presentation to them. So I said, okay. A little while after that, this writer was writing articles that Larry Johnson and Stacey Ogden turned down the pros to come back. Now they can't go to the tournament. If Tark really loved his team, why doesn't he offer to sit out the tournament? Making me look like I'm selfish and this is what I'd offer to do. A month later, I told him the story. He said, Jerry, that's the damnest thing. He said, Maxim was calling him and telling him, why doesn't Tark offer to sit out the tournament? After I went and offered, they told me not to say nothing. It was amazing that it would be so Machiavellian, and yet it was. I guess if you're going to do anything like that, Las Vegas is the perfect place for it. I thought that the university should have been extremely proud of everything we did. I know all the people told us they were. The college president was writing me letters telling us how great we were doing. I thought he was 100% behind us. President Maxson knew that he couldn't fire Jerry Tarkanian. He knew that there were going to have to be people who were going to have to help him do it. And after the 90 season, they hired Dennis Finfrock to be the athletic director. Finfrock had no qualifications to be an athletic director. He put him in just to destroy the basketball program. One of the things the administration did was plant a camera. That darn cameras. Cameras in the vents. A video camera was concealed inside an air vent in the North Gym. They were filming him. To be able to catch him practicing before, under NCAA rules, he could do that. How the hell you film your own team? What are they filming? If I found out that my administration planted a camera in the room, I would probably do something to the administrator responsible with that camera, and it wouldn't be to take his picture. With controversy swirling around them, the Rebels finally got some good news on the eve of the season. A threatened lawsuit by several UNLV players forced the NCAA to lift its postseason ban. In defending its title, UNLV would be a team on a mission. We were extremely focused. I think we were a better basketball team. Anytime you accomplish what we did the year before, you're going to build on that. They were together like no team you could ever imagine. They never talked about sticking it to Bob Maxson or sticking it to the NCAA. At that point, they had so much disdain for everybody, frankly. One, two, three. No, no interviews. The bunker mentality had really set in. Unified, UNLV lived up to its rebel nickname by playing with a brash, aggressive, us-against-them attitude. On the court, it worked. But the same behavior also reinforced the negative public perception of UNLV. The attitude was, Tarkanian has a bunch of thugs to play basketball. That wasn't it. The perception of, of Swagger was probably more one of unity and them coming together. Just realize that only somebody we got to depend on is ourselves, And, you know, we don't want to let each other down. So, you know, that just made us grow closer together. I think they took a little pride in the fact that some people might call them thugs and they were going to prove them different. As the year progressed, UNLV was unbeatable. The Rebels dominated opponents, winning by an average of nearly 30 points per game. 
When it reached the Final Four with a record of 34-0, UNLV seemed destined to win its second consecutive NCAA championship. To win every single game, not only did I feel like they are going to win the title, I felt like they're never going to lose another game. This could go on for 10, maybe 15 years. In the national semifinal, UNLV had a rematch with Duke. Tell them going back. One, two, three, back. A team looking for revenge. My dad said this before we played them, and I thought he was nuts. I thought when you beat a team as bad as you beat Duke, you take their heart from those kids. And my dad said normally that would happen, but those Duke players are made up of kids from competitive families. Grant Hill's dad was a great football player. Bobby Hurley's dad was a competitive coach. He said, you don't take the heart from those kids, you make them more determined. He was scared to death to play Duke that game. From the opening tip, Duke proved Tark a prophet. Grant Hill for Duke. The Blue Devils got off to a quick start and then unleashed a smothering defense which shut down the running Rebels. Duke's strategy worked. And when the Rebels lost their leader on a controversial call midway through the second half, a tight game turned. And charge. Yes, they called a charge on Anthony. No basket. And that's it. He's out of here. Five for Anthony. With Greg Anthony gone, the Rebels looked vulnerable for the first time all year. 219 to play. Hurley for three. Bottom! Grant Hill driving. Baseline, he finds Davis. Off the glass. Score it, and he's fouled. UNLV has not been in this situation all season. And when Christian Leitner hit two foul shots with 12 seconds left, UNLV's 45-game winning streak was in danger. Duke is 12 seconds away from one of the biggest upsets in Final Four history. Let's go, Rebels! Let's go, Rebels! Larry Johnson brings the ball up. Looks like he wants to go all the way with it. He's outside now, stopping his dribble, Leitner on him. Hunt will have to do something. Look at Three! Three! Off the back of the I just feel so bad for the kids because it's the greatest group of kids I've ever been around. I just heard inside for them. I remember really like throwing up a little bit into my mouth when they lost because it was so sickening. When we lost that game, it was a state of mourning here in Las Vegas. It was like the rest of the country felt when JFK died. When we return to Rebels on the Run, the program suffers its most devastating blow. Losing to Duke in the national semifinal was a blow to the Run and Rebels pride. But what happened two months later turned out to be the beginning of the end for Tark at UNLV. The infamous hot tub picture. One more nail in the coffin. The last straw. I wasn't real pleased to see that hot tub photo. On May 26, 1991, the Las Vegas Review Journal published a photo of Richie the Fixer Perry in a hot tub. Sitting with him were three UNLV players Moses Scurry, David Butler, and Anderson Hunt. Although the full story of how the paper acquired the picture remains untold, almost immediately the national media picked up the story, creating a frenzy of negative press. Coach Tarkanian on numerous occasions has warned us to stay away from people like Richard Perry. You can't expect him to control people's lives. If some players want to go to a hot tub, they're going to go to a hot tub. The photos didn't surprise me because I've been close to the program for a couple years and I'd seen people like Richard Perry with these players constantly. If you're Jerry, I mean, what kind of defense do you have? But no one knows when that picture was taken. The kids swore that that picture was taken before I told them not to go. At the stage when people were trying to say, when was the picture taken, you're splitting hairs. You got your players in a hot tub with a convicted gambler, you know? It's a hard argument to make that in Las Vegas, of all places, that that's not a bad thing. With the damaging photo, President Maxson finally had enough evidence to force Tark out. The only way that his career at UNLV was going to come down was for somebody in a position of power to show some conscience and say, the winning isn't worth it, the money isn't worth it, the fame isn't worth it. We are a university first, and it's time to start acting like one. You are seeing the passing of an era. I've been in a constant battle with the NC2A, and that's, that's been very hard on me and my family and, and people closely associated with me. 
And then this recent thing uh, is just, it's been so hard on my family. I mean, I can, I'm used to this and I can handle this pretty well. Uh, I can just block myself out of that. But, uh, you know, I'd go home and see to hurt my family and that bothered me. I remember watching and fighting back tears. It was very emotional. It's tough for me. <laughs> After 18 years. In agreeing to step down, Tarkanian was allowed to coach one final season. The Rebels went 26-2, ending Tark's successful yet tumultuous 19-year reign at UNLV with 509 wins, four Final Fours, one national championship, and a line of supporters as long as the Vegas Strip. I don't think there's any question Jerry Tarkanian is one of the best college coaches of all time. You knew when you played a Jerry Tarkanian team that you had better play well in all phases of the game or you would be exploited. The people that played for Jerry, I'm sure, left as better individuals than they were when they joined the program. He was really successful with young people. I thought it was a program with dignity, integrity. They weren't perfect, but they did an outstanding job of allowing young people to play basketball and get an education. It was a feeling of accomplishment. The fact that the group that worked hard to bring him here were totally successful in achieving their objectives. After the dust settled, Tark took a few years off and then went to coach his alma mater, Fresno State, in 1995. Again, he was successful. But again, his teams were plagued with off-the-court problems which led to NCAA sanctions. The pattern for Jerry Tarkanian, wherever he's been, Long Beach State, UNLV, Fresno State, he was at all three places. All three places got in trouble with the NCAA and were sanctioned very heavily. He is the consistent factor in that. So was he wrong in certain instances? I'm sure. Were people out to get him because they didn't like him? No doubt. But at the end of the day, all that happened, he never took responsibility for anything. He never held himself accountable in a way that you would hope a basketball coach would hold accountable his players and the people around him. Whether or not Tarkanian was a target, or if in fact he did bend the rules, his ongoing battle with the NCAA did eventually come to an end. In 1992, Tark sued the organization for harassment. Six years later, the side settled out of court the NCAA paid Jerry Tarkanian $2.5 million, although there was no admission of liability on either side. I was hoping that that would vindicate me some, that there would be some people say, you know, maybe Tark was telling the truth, but it didn't happen. I don't think anybody that read about the settlement with Tarkanian now thinks he was an honest guy, above board, did nothing wrong because he's the poster child for NCAA investigations, for NCAA probations. He always will be. It overwhelms his legacy as a basketball coach. While the public feud severely damaged both sides, its resolution did have a positive effect on NCAA policy. There is no question the NCAA is a better institution today and that its investigations are better done today than they were in 1977. Now. When a statement is taken, you have a chance to review it. Statements are often tape recorded today. They didn't used to be. There are some real functional changes in NCAA justice that are directly relational to Jerry Tarkanian. As for UNLV, its basketball teams never came close to recapturing the glory of the Tarkanian years. Soon after he left, NCAA tournament appearances became few and far between. So did the fans who had once adored Tarkanian and his rebels on the run. Those are the people who suffered the most. The people in the community who had something that they truly enjoyed and now it's gone. It's like if you had a great car that you loved and somebody keyed it and then drove it into the pool. UNLV certainly benefited from having Jerry Tarkanian as its coach. He put UNLV on the map. And to this day, when you think of UNLV, you think of Tark, and whatever sizzle or coolness is still there, it's there because of him. And you have to give the man credit for bringing that to that university because it wasn't there before he got there.